Good morning. Butch Eichels, the Country Church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Country Church on Wednesday night, if you're watching my live stream or if you're watching the video. Or glad to see everybody tonight. And uh, Awana Choir started back up, so if you've got kids who are Awana age, um, 5.30 they meet right over here in the music room and encourage you to encourage them to come and so uh, anybody ready to praise the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship, worship the Lord. Just one word come nuts around. Darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do just one word you hear what's broken inside me thank you lord just one word and you revive every dream Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Who oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Praise the name, makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. standing let's go to the lord in prayer father we just thank you for this midweek service thank you that we can be here and get refreshed and refilled revitalized revived excited 
about you and your way and your will for our life. Father, we pray that you'd bless each person above ourselves. May we all be drawn close to Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. And as people said, amen. amen. Thank you, and you be seated. Good to have each one of you. Do we have anybody visiting for the first time tonight? If you are, just hold up your hand just a second. All right. You look familiar, so praise the God. Praise the Lord that you're here. Amen. You praying for rain? Somebody said that this weekend, I told him if it rains, Hilmer, give him $50. <laughs> so somebody's got to do it. Anyway, good to be in his house. Pray for Brother Dave as he not only leads us in praise and worship, but as he brings the word tonight. Amen. 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 Brother.
what he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven, my future is heaven, I praise God for what he's On the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. Oh, look at the wounds that give me life. Grace flowing from His side. No greater sacrifice. Come on. What is done? praise God for what he's done. We, we, Paul and I and Ruthann did that little set there intentionally. It started out with the, 
statement, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing our God can't do. And we have a friend, many of the ladies at the country church know this friend, Sharon Sands up in Colorado, who's come here to speak several times. She has a phrase that she uses repeatedly, and it's this phrase, the Redeemer can't help but redeem. The Redeemer can't help but redeem because he's, He's a redeemer. That's what redeemers do is redeemers redeem. So we confess what there's nothing our God can't do. There's nobody he can't redeem. Just look around. <laughs> Better yet, look in the mirror. <laughs> um, there's nothing our God can't do. The redeemer can't help but redeem. And so we finished with that statement. So I praise God for what he's done. There's nothing he can't do. Nobody too tough for Jesus. Redeemer can't help but redeem. And so we praise God for what he has done. It's important for us to be mindful about what the Lord has done. And there are benchmarks that happen in our lives and uh, today is one of those benchmarks in my life. No, I was not a PGA golfer in a former life. <laughs> Stay in your lane, Mike. Stay in your lane. Anybody know what this is? This belonged to a man who praised the Lord up here for years and years on the front row of the choir, and he didn't get a walking stick. He had this golf iron to help him get around, and he just liable to just get lit in the midst of the praise of the Lord, and you knew that Wes was lit because he'd reach down and grab this iron, and he'd just... Give the devil this. And today would have been uh, Wes Cobb's 81st birthday. And he's been in heaven near about five, I guess, five years now. It's hard to believe, isn't it, Eric? Man, five years. So I don't know how I ended up with this except that I think I told Becky, she says, anything you want? And I said, I want Wes Cobb's weapon. <laughs> I want his weapon of warfare against the devil. And so um, when the rapture happens, this might be one thing that will go with me, you know. <laughs> we, we, we make benchmarks in our lives of special people and special times, and we're mindful. There's a mindfulness about how we should live our lives. Say that again. There's a mindfulness with which we ought to live our lives. And so that brings us to our text tonight. Uh, back in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, those who can and will, would you stand together for the reading of those two all too familiar verses? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Would you pray with me? Master, as we yield our hearts and our mind, our affection to these words, we pray that you would make us mindful of what you would have for us. And it's possible because you are an omnipresent God, you are everywhere at the same time present, 
that you may be able to speak one particular thing to one particular person and the person right next to them, Lord, you will emphasize another aspect of this. And so may each one of us be mindful for what you have for us corporately and individually tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Last month, we looked at this Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 passage that describes in a way that we're to live our lives and to act out a reasonable service. There are only 24 hours in a day. There's your news flash for the day. Each and every day of the week, every month, every year. And in Romans chapter 12, Paul is contending for how mindfully we spend these precious 24 hours one day at a time as Christ followers. He encourages us that we should consider these one 24-hour day, one day at a time, as acts of reasonable service, worship is about our lives being lived out each and every day, one 24-hour span at a time, or what I've come to call 124 worship, or a 124 worship lifestyle. Because worship is a lifestyle, it's not just a weekly event. For many of us, however, subtly or unintentionally in practical application as we live out our lives in these 24-hour days, worship is many times defined solely as something we do on Sunday or on Wednesday. Subtly and unintentionally, we move away from the lifestyle, living a life of worship, not just weekly event to weekly event to weekly event. It's not always consistently front of mind. We're not always mindful about that. I had a wonderful conversation with Marty Archibek after uh, the message last month, and she was, she was just going on about the, the magnificent and manifold mercies of God. We talked about the mercies of God, and, and she just kept saying, you know, those mercies are new every morning. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. If you're here today and you're not consumed right now, it's because God is merciful. It, it It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new Every morning. And then that old hymn we sang last Sunday, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Aren't we grateful that if we feel like we've exhausted the mercies of God, and I don't know if you've ever felt like that before, but you feel like you've exhausted the mercies of God, the truth is that's an impossibility because he has a storehouse of mercy. You don't have to go online and register for it or order like H-E-B and pull up and text message when you get to the spot. You know, I'm in spot number 432. I might be here for a minute. Or you don't have to renew your, your Prime subscription and wait for the gray van to pull up so your neighbors can peep out of their window and say, I wonder what they're getting today. Now, if we need new mercies because his compassions fail not and because of his great faithfulness, he has a place where we can get them. Go to sleep and wake up. And overnight, God has deposited new and fresh mercies in our account. That's something to be mindful about because he's inexhaustible and his supply, his riches in glory never wear 
out or run out. A 124 worshiper is enabled to experience an ongoing renewal of the mercies of God day by day as a daily lifestyle, not just going from one weekly event to the next. And Paul says, I beseech you, I'm begging you, brethren, this is to Christ followers. He's writing this section, this chapter to people who know Jesus as Savior by the mercies of God that have just been described in Romans chapter 1 through 11. On the basis of that, be motivated to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And because of the finished work of Jesus, having died once and all, satisfying the wrath of God required against sin, rightfully so, you and I can, you can live holy. You can live acceptable unto God. Not perfect, but set apart lives unto God, which is your reasonable service. Living sacrifices are living because they come willingly and alive to the altar. And living sacrifices are living because they stay alive at the altar. The the Old Testament model, this would have been striking to these readers of this letter in Rome because they're used to, yeah, I'm going to bring a sacrifice and we're going to slaughter that sacrifice in our place and that sacrifice is dead. And Paul says, you have a sacrifice that's been offered for you. And he died once for all, so you come as a living sacrifice sacrifice. And that brings us to verse two, where we are tonight. Don't be conformed and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, mindfulness. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul is still in his posture of beseeching And he's saying that we are to be nonconformist. Be a nonconformist, but be a nonconformist to the world. As Christ followers, we are in the process of becoming conformed nonconformist. Conformed nonconformist. Now, Some of you are saying, no, wait, you just read verse two. It's, it's, don't you mean transformed nonconformist? No, I mean conformed nonconformist. This is called Dave's World. Welcome to Dave's World. Next week, we start our choir rehearsal again, music in the music room right over here. You're all invited to come and sing your praise to the Lord after the sermon next week. Um, The choir is used to this. That group of troubadours is used to, we'll be in the middle of rehearsal and all of a sudden somebody says, yeah, we're in Dave's world now. We'll get to the transformation part. We should, I hope, because it, yeah, it's on the screen. But for now, let's stay with this matter of conformed, conformation. When Paul says, be not conformed to this world, he has a specific conforming or conformation in mind. Last month I read from the late 1972 J.B. Phillips translation of this section of scripture and I did so not by way of just the translation but as a as a commentary on these two verses if I could I'd like to read that that little section again this is Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 from the J.B. Phillips translation we use it as a commentary tonight about these verses with eyes Wide open to the mercies of God. I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, 
to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. But let God remake you so that your whole attitude of mind is changed. Thus, you will prove in practice that the will of God's good, acceptable to him, and perfect. Don't let the world around you squeeze you, shape you into its own mold. Here Paul shows us that um, biblical conformation comes by biblical transformation. Let me say that again. Biblical transformation. Conformation, conforming, biblical conformation comes by biblical transformation. And we can be misleading, something can be misleading in that, that we might believe that external conforming doesn't doesn't matter. It's only internal transforming that matters. But Paul has addressed that four chapters earlier in Romans. If you still have your Bible open... Turn, if you would, four chapters previous, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 28. Many of you can quote this verse from memory. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. In other words, Paul shows us that it is God's desire for us to be externally conformed but not conformed to this world and the confirmation that takes place, conformation that takes place isn't happening from the outside in, but from the inside out. And what he's going for is the image of his son to be represented through us, that we are being conformed to the image of Jesus. The Greek word for conformed here is not quite the same word that it is in Romans chapter 12. And the only other place that this word in Romans 8 is found, the word for conformed, it's used in Philippians chapter 3. So if you Bible drill Wednesday night, Turn over to the right to Philippians chapter 3. And bear with me as I read a section of scripture out of Philippians chapter 3. Biblical external conformation comes by biblical internal transformation. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though, Paul says, I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. You... You think you can trust in your pedigree, in your performance, external performance of the flesh? I got you. I got you. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is in the law. This is a stout statement. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I'm blameless. 
But what things were gained to me that I just listed, that's a big gain. I count those I counted for loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness, not, my, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that, that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable. There's that same word that was in Romans 8. Conformable unto his death. And if I lost you in that long passage of Scripture, come, come back with me if you would. There is an external conforming which God is going for in your life and in mine right now, tonight. He, he's going for it right now, tonight, in you and in me. He aims to externally conform us to be conformed to the image of his Son, Romans 8, to look like his son. And that conformation is being made conformable in a specific aspect of his son. Being conformable unto his death. Wait a minute, David. The previous verse, he said, come as a living sacrifice. And when as I come as a living sacrifice, when he starts conforming me by internally transforming me, he doesn't conform me to his life. He, he conforms me to his death. God is in the process of conforming us into the image of his son, and that image is in the image of his death. Luke 9, 23 and 24, you know this passage. He said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, 124 worship right there, daily, and follow me for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, that's an important qualifier. The same shall save it. What an odd kingdom the Redeemer has established. It's almost like it's upside down. You know why it's almost like it's upside down? Because we're upside down. You and I were made for an existence with God that was sin-free, untainted by sin. And the whole world system eagerly groans for salvation to be made manifest. The reason why this kingdom feels like it's an upside down kingdom is because it is. And when people look at you and me and they see the image of his son, it's not going to look like what we think it's going to look like. Debbie Winston, I don't think she'd mind me saying this to you. She, she was in HEB earlier this week and she was getting some avocados. Avocados from Mexico. I love avocados. Can I get a witness? I don't love how much they cost now. Are you kidding me? So she's going through the avocados and she's doing what we do with avocados so that the next person that picks them up, they'll get bruised avocados or whatever. 
And you, I mean, you know, look, look, Dave's world, you got to get your avocados at just the right point. If you're going to eat them like in the next day, they have to be, you know, got to have a little bit of give to them. You know, if it's going to be a few days away, no, not quite as much give. If you're going to go tonight, oh man, you won't want to, you know, you know, you know, if you know, you know. So Debbie's, you know, doing her routine with the avocados and she strikes up a conversation with the guy who's the, you know, the guy in the produce area working for HEB and they start talking and he's got plans for the Labor Day weekend, blah, blah, blah. And in the midst of the conversation, however they got on the subject, it, it prompted this HEB worker to say, well, before we go, can I pray for you? And she said, right there in the avocado aisle, of H-E-B, we just bowed our heads and this guy who works in the produce section of A-B, H-E-B just prayed an amazing prayer over me. I had asked the Debbie says, I had asked the Lord, Lord, help me to be a blessing. This guy was a blessing to me. It was an unexpected, mindful event for somebody who was willing to lose his life for Christ's sake. Because Debbie could have said, I don't believe in your Jesus. It, it, it took a risk to be mindful enough to say, I, I'm willing to follow Jesus, this young man to follow Jesus into this, not a big risk. I mean, come on, it's H-E-B produce, produce aisle. But they had church right there in the H-E-B. This is an upside down kingdom. Come after me. You want to come after me, Jesus says? Well, you want to come after me? Deny you. And be conformed to my, take up your cross daily. Be conformed to my death. You want to save your life? Who in here wants to save your life? I want to save my life. All right, lose it. I mean, follow, this is simple math. Just follow the Follow the stream of connectivity to the motive. My motive is I want to save my life. If you really want to save your life, don't strive to save your life. Lose it for Christ's sake, and then you'll save your life. I mean, school's back in session. Did you follow that little algebra equation right there? My motive is to save my life. So the way to save my life is not to try and save my life, but to lose my life for his sake, conformed to his death. I'm, I'm willing to lose my life for your sake. That's the one who saves it. That's why I say that as Christ followers, we are in the process of becoming conformed nonconformists. We don't let the world, even, even, let me say it this way, even the religious world. You know, there's a religious world that'll say, okay, make sure you do the right behaviors. Make sure you don't cross the expectation barriers. Make sure you don't violate the religious rules. And, and, Paul said, Christ set you free on purpose for a purpose, that you'd be free. So don't be yoked again to a yoke of religious slavery. If, if we're talking about a true transformation, something's going to happen on the inside that's going to manifest on the outside that may not look like, it may look like you've traded whom you are bound to, who you are a slave to. Yeah, I am no longer a slave to unrighteousness, but I am a glad bondservant to righteousness. We are not to let the world, even the religious world, think Paul's pedigree to squeeze us into its mold from the outside. Rather, Paul says our external conformity into his image, the image of his death, is to take place by a supernatural, internal, ongoing transformation. 
God's family, his sons and daughters, are those who are being transformed from the inside out, not conformed from the outside in, as Kenneth Wiest says, Brother Butch, are putting to test what is the will of God, the good and well-pleasing and complete will. And having found that it meets specifications, place your approval on it. That's like old English kind of grammar in that paragraph. Here's what that means. In other words, from the inside out, when this transformation takes place, not the outside in, we are to be becoming transformed so that we gladly and willingly say yes and amen to the good, well-pleasing, complete will of God. It becomes the desire of our souls. Most of you will know this already, that the Greek word here for transformed in verse 2 of chapter 12 is metamorpho or metamorpho, from which we get our word metamorphosis. Think tadpole to frog or caterpillar to butterfly. Metamorphosis is where Barry McGuire got the text for his children's song he wrote, Bullfrogs and Butterflies. They've both been born again. That's what came right out of that. Transformed. How do we get there? How do we get to this internal transformation? How do we move from external conformity to the world or even the religious world to an internal transformation of gladly and willingly, not begrudgingly saying yes and amen to the good, well-pleasing, complete will of God. Well, Paul tells us right here in this text, right in the middle of verse 2, Romans 12, six little words, by the renewing of your mind. Being mindful. This renewal of the mind is not just an intellectual change or transformation. To the degree that our minds are being renewed, to that same degree will we experience his transformation. Let me say that again. To the degree that our minds are being renewed, and remember, he's writing this to believers. This isn't, this isn't the transformation of darkness into light for salvation. It is salvation of sanctification to where he's renewing and renewing and renewing, as Paul said to the Corinthian church, from glory to glory to glory. It's a progression to the degree that our minds are being in the process of being renewed to that same degree will experience transformations. Our minds are a passage, passageway into our hearts. My mind is a passageway into my heart. Your mind is a passageway. It's a doorway into your heart. What we think about a circumstance or how we think about a situation or we think about a person or a place or a thing or even how we view ourselves, think about ourselves. This will affect what we do and why we do it and how we respond to circumstances or situations or persons or even to ourselves. And you know this to be true. I recently became acquainted with a neurosurgeon and author who used to live in San Antonio. He now lives in Nevada. He's a brain surgeon and author named Dr. Lee Warren. He's a brain surgeon and an author and he loves Jesus. And here's a quote that he says, you can't change your life until you change your mind. This is a brain surgeon with multiple degrees. And that's just country church common horse sense right there. You can't change your life until you change your mind. The Bible word for that is Repent. See, repentance isn't just for conversion. Repentance is a good word for you and I as we are being transformed. Even now, we are 
in the process of becoming conformed to his image, the image of his death, conformed, non-conformists. We're not conforming to the world, the external pressures, but being conformed by this internal transformation. So how does that happen? I just suggest as we close a couple of, couple of thoughts. We can allow ourselves to be transformed by, and this is, again, not all exhaustive. It's just a couple of thoughts to give us tonight by what I would call mindful prayer. M mindful prayer. I mean, a lot of times we'll pray because it's we're about to eat. So we just, so we pray. Or a lot of times we pray at the beginning of a event or so because that's what you do. You have an invocation. and you, my, Pause and mindfully Pray. Maybe even it's this kind of prayer out of Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Because when I think about this or I think about him or I think about her or I think about me, I don't have a right spirit about that. And so I want to put a bracket around this moment and I want to pray Psalm 51, 10. Create, do what I can't do myself. Create in me what I can't create for myself. As we spend daily time with God in his word and prayer, let's be mindful to ask him, wash me, wash me, Lord, with the washing of the water by the word that comes right out of Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. mindfully reading the Word. I have a devotion pretty much every morning. I try to be in the Word pretty much every Mindfully spend time in the Word. Lord, would you wash me with this Word? We can allow ourselves to be transformed by mindful trust. Mindful trust, trust that the Holy Spirit is doing this ongoing supernatural biblical internal external conformation by biblical internal transformation. Trust that he's doing that. Why? Because that's, that's what he's going for in you and I. He's going for that conformed image of his son in the confirmation of his death. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, Proverbs 3, 5. Lean not on your own understanding. In other words, when it doesn't look like that's what he's doing. I mean, there's that, that verse, and I've said this before, there's that verse in, I can't remember the reference right now because I don't have it in my notes. When the, when the Spirit comes, he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's in John. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that last little judgment part is a, he says an unusual thing. He, the Holy Spirit will convict you of judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Why would I need the Holy Spirit to convince me, convict me, that the ruler of this world has been, past tense, judged? Because it doesn't look like it. I gotta have a mindful trust that what God has said he's going to do, he's going to do. And I need the Holy Spirit to do that in me because I can't do that in myself. And then finally, mindful obedience. Trust and Obey. It's a little worship leader deal there. Mindful trust and then mindful obedience. Um, by his grace, let's seek to put off the old man and put on the, the new man. Put off Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind again that's Ephesians 
4, 22 and following. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the, old, uh, the new man after which God is created. Seek to participate in things that build up the new man and don't build up the old man. Seek, seek to obey the Lord by participating in things that build up the new man, but don't build up the old man. And then by, by his grace, let's seek to take our thoughts captive. You can't change your life until you change your mind. Zig Ziglar used to say it this way. We all need a daily checkup from the neck up to avoid stinking thinking, which ultimately leads to hardening of the attitudes. That's some good Yazoo County wisdom right there. Paul said it this way. No, he didn't. He said something entirely different. This is what he said. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to obedience of Christ. Bring every thought into obedience. Every thought I have is not always right. And I got news for you. Every thought you always have is not always right. It may be your perspective. It may be how you see it and how you understand it. And it may be culturally, well, that's your truth. No, no, no there's truth. Take every thought captive. When, when you have these thoughts, when your mind starts, you start wrestling with your mind. You ever wrestle with your mind? When you start wrestling with your mind, Lord, would you captivate that thought? The best place that I know, the best place that I know to have my mind renewed is in the presence of the Lord. Because in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611, David said, thou hast taught me the path of life. I know the path of life. I know how to live this life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Mick Jagger said, I can't get no, I can't get no, I can't get no. Bunch of rolling stone <laughs> heathens. Look at y'all heathens. <laughs> Where's Wes's golf club? <laughs> There's only one place to find full satisfaction. In your presence is fullness of joy. When you experience something joyful, you want to suck the marrow out of that moment. I, I want to get all of it that I can. I want it to be as full as it possibly can be. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. And you know what else about that? When you get into a place where you are satisfied, you don't want it to ever end. That's what it's like in the presence of the Lord. And that's the only place. Well, that day's coming, Dave. You know, that's, that's heaven. My, my sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. That's the future. What about now? Listen, if you want to know what the Lord has to say so you can be mindful, look at what he has said. As we get into his word in prayer, just us in the Lord or corporately in settings like this, or could it even be as an adult, I'd go to a Sunday school class or a 
a Bible study class. We're to renew our mind. It's not just an intellectual change. But as a 124 worshiper, don't be externally conformed by the outside in, from the outside in. But rather allow yourself to be transformed so that yes and amen to the good and well-pleasing will of God may occur. Close with this one little quote from a friend of mine who is in heaven now. Um, I wrote this quote in an article last week. This is Dave Busby in the now out of print, The Heart of the Matter, moving from the external pressure of religion to the internal passion of Christianity. The heart of the matter, moving from the external pressure of religion to the internal passion of Christianity. Here's what he writes. If I've discovered anything about Christianity, it's that Christianity is about what hap what's happening inside. If you allow God to take care of what's inside, the outside will take care of itself. Now, that's just good Bible right there. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart, even tonight in this room. If God wants anything, he wants your heart. If God wants anything, He wants your heart. Why? Because he knows if he has your heart, he'll get the outside too. Tonight, are there some areas in our lives that we may need to be freshly mindful about to present to him fresh tonight as a, a living sacrifice? It might not be everybody in the room, but it, you might be here and this is just, this, I'm wrestling with this. Lord, I don't want to give this over to you. This is, a, this is a sacrifice for me to say, I trust you. To be freshly mindful of presenting that area as a living sacrifice, as a 124 today, 124 hour period worshiper. Is there a mindful prayer that we need to pray? And maybe it might even be a prayer of repenting which that's a good word. It's a good word. Or maybe a mindful trust. We've placed our confidence in ourselves or in someone else. If this is going to happen, I've got to do it myself. Trust. Lord, I need to freshly just say, I trust you. Doesn't look like it on the outside now, but transform me to trust you in the middle of this and then mindfully obey the Lord. Brother Butch, would you come? And as he comes, if tonight you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, that's really the first place you need to start. Is to say, you know, Jesus, I, I need you. I need you to do what I can't do for myself. During this invitation, we're going to sing a song. You can come take Brother Butch by the hand. Just say, man, I, I need that in my life. And he'll know what to do. Perhaps you've received Jesus as your Savior, but you've been coming maybe for a while and you've been seeing this thing called water baptism, believer's baptism, and you're coming to understand that that can't wash away my sins, but my sins have been washed away and I need to be obedient, trust and obey. I need to be conformed to the likeness of his death and I need to lay that down, be willing to lose my my life, my reputation, and say yes. I'm going to say yes to the Lord and be obedient. Follow the Lord in believer's baptism. If you'll come down here and take Brother Butch by the hand during this invitation, he'll know what to do. Or maybe you believe, you know, the Lord has just drawn me to this family, this, this community of faith, these 124 worshipers that meet at the country church and you sense the spirit drawing you, you can just come down to the aisle at this invitation and say to the pastor, say to Brother Butch, I, I believe God's drawn me here. He'll, he'll know what to do. Or maybe you just need to use your the area around your chair or these altars just to say, 
I want to come as a living sacrifice tonight, Lord, and do business with the Lord. Brother Butch. Would you stand tonight? Scripture says in 1 Samuel 16, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the blood of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and idolatry. So tonight, that old phrase, trust and obey, for there's no other way, still holds true tonight. God speaks, will you come? Just like you are. God spoken to you. He's convicted you. And he's drawing you to himself. Will you make that decision for him? Not for us, but for the Lord. Lord, would you work on the inside to make me what I need to be on the outside? Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave. Thank the Lord for his word. Amen. It's a living word. And it'll transform our lives if we'll let it. We'll let him. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, it's good for us to be here. And Lord, I thank you for this word tonight from you. And Father, we pray it won't fall on deaf ears that we'd not just be hearers of the word, but we'd be doers also. And Lord, we pray that you would do in us and through us what we're incapable of doing on our own. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for each person that's here. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you for coming. Men, remember, no man left behind on Saturday. And uh, we'll see you on Sunday.